Hello and welcome to the City Library of Uppsala, our public library. I'm not sure what the vernacular is in uh, English. Um, uh, I'm very honored to be here today and to lead this discussion with Lavette Yellow, uh, who's joining us today. This is uh, the second discussion or the second talk in the series called Svenskhetens Vildkor, uh, the terms of Swedishness, in which we discuss kind of the thresholds around uh, how to the exclusionary pra practices around Swedishness can make you feel like you're not part of Sweden. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very happy and honored to have you here. It's an honor to be here. And um, so you are an activist. Ex-activist. Ex-activist, of course. <laughs> uh, you have won a lot of prizes yeah. for your activism. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're an author and you just came out with, or you're coming out with a new book. Um, and we will get the chance to discuss that one today, mm -hmm. which is very cool. And I only got the chance to start reading it last night at five o'clock. So I've read as much as I could, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm very happy to be able to ask some questions about it. Oh, brilliant. Um, so to start us off, mm -hmm. I listened to your TED talk from 2018, in which you discuss your voice and finding your voice. And it made me think about uh, Audre Lorde and her, your silence will not protect you. Mm -hmm. So I guess I just wanted to know, like, what does finding your voice mean for you and how can other people try to find their voice? Well, considering my mom is here today, I think she can confirm that as a child, I could speak before I could even walk because I was so keen on communicating and I was around a lot of adults and I had a lot of questions. So I found my voice very young. And I was raised in a home where my grandmother was a politician in Gambia uh, for 30 years, working for women's issues and women's health, which wasn't very popular at the time. Um, I was raised around black women who had their voices. She, they didn't wait for people to give them voices. They just had their voices and they used them um, however they choose. And coming to Sweden, I think that's where my voice was taken from me. So I lost a lot of my voice because I wasn't any longer Lovette the person. I was Lovette the African. I was Lovette the black girl. I was Lovette the activist at some point. It was always somebody voicing what I was. And at some point you start believing that. You start believing what people define you as rather than being authentically who you are. And it wasn't until I left and went to England when I was about 20 that I actually found my voice again. So when Audre Lorde says, your silence cannot protect you, it means that some of us have actually no choice but to speak because being silent does not protect you because you will be at the mercy of people with limited perceptions defining who you are constantly. And as a black woman, that's a problem. That's a problem because we're always defined by someone else's parameters of success, parameters of life. And it's tragic. So you were ascribed a lot of uh, things that you don't adhere to. Mm -hmm. And as you said, it's kind of like you were silenced by uh, coming to Sweden. Yeah. And the, just coming to this context made you silent. And it's interesting what you said about how, um, like, believing what people say about you because mm -hmm. if you have like James Baldwin in, his, in the beginning of his The Fire Next Time he mm -hmm. speaks about uh, the danger for people is just believing mm -hmm. other people's stories about you rather than just the way they speak about you. Yeah, Believing it is the yeah. hard part. Believing it is the hard part. It is the heartbreaking part. And that has to end at some point and I think it comes with maturity because I think we're in a stage right now where many people are defined by what people think they are but we have to also accept that we have many different versions of ourselves that exist in people's minds. I've met you today, there will be a version of me that will be in your head and the people that have known me in different scenarios will have a version and we have to be okay with that as well. We don't have to believe it, we don't have to love it, we just have to accept that's reality, yeah. And as, of course, we, uh, I work at Friends, I'm an expert uh, in bullying, and we work with youth a lot. So mm -hmm. in the question of for kids to find their voice or mm -hmm. young people find their voice, do you have any like advice as to how to find your voice? 
I think um, sometimes people say, Levesque speaks for the voiceless. I don't, I never have because every human being has a voice. I have a little niece, um, Sky, and she is about a year and a half now. She has a voice. If you give her food she doesn't want to eat, she says no. You know, if she wants to drink, she says drink. Um, so I think my advice to children and young people is just exercise those vocal cords. Exercise them in class. Exercise them at home. Exercise them in the playground. Just make sure you use it so you don't lose it, as they say. Yeah. Don't let anything silence you. Yeah. So it's more of kind of trying to min maintain the voice that you already have than finding it. And for you, it was refinding it mm -hmm. when you came to. You will England. lose it many times um, as a young child in a classroom. Teachers will silence you. Um, when you come in the workplace, you will be silenced by your bosses. But it's also knowing where your moral compass lies. And if you feel like something is valuable enough to talk about, don't let anybody silence you. Not even, you know, the king and queen of Sweden should be able to silence anybody that has something to say. Yeah. Not even me. I shouldn't silence anybody. Hmm. That's very true. And uh, like moving on, uh, in your book, you talk a lot about the importance of having an intersectional analysis, and that's something that's very important in the work that we're doing, that I'm doing at Friends. Uh, but can you talk about what that means and like your intersectional positioning in mm -hmm. uh, being a black woman, but also with autism mm -hmm. and what that has meant for you? I think every human being that you meet in life has many different identities. A white woman can, for example, be gay or Muslim as much as I am. So it's important when you meet people, no matter what age they are, that you actually realize that they are so much more than what you see. But when it comes to the fight that I fight in education and just trying to spread knowledge with people, it's also understanding that I have many different identities. So nobody can ask me, for example, I'll give you an anecdote. Um, a few years ago, when I was in the beginning of activism, I was invited by quite a large Swedish institution that does panels. And it, this panel was very interesting. It was supposed to be a feminism panel. And I was the only black person. So they contact me. They want me to go and be on that panel. And I say, yeah, I would love to talk about what it means to be a feminist. And everything was going on well until the day before. They gave me a call. They wanted to make sure that I was okay with what's going to happen. And then she said something that only Swedish people know how to do best. She does this, and I go, oh, you know? And she goes, oh, one more thing. And I said, oh, yeah, what, 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 what do you mean? Or what is it? And she says, it would be very nice if you didn't talk about racism during this panel because it's only about feminism. And I go, that's going to be difficult because you're asking me to leave my blackness outside of the room and just come in with my vagina. Um, that's not going to happen. Um, I'm black. Every part of me is black. Racism is the part of my life. So you either take me as I am or you leave all of me out of it. And I think the Shans beskrivning probably got her a little bit nervous because she was like, no, 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 that's not how I meant. And I was like, you mean you don't want me to talk about racism which impacts sec how sexism manifests against me. If I'm out on a night out and a man attacks me or says something inappropriate, they may say inappropriate things to me as a woman, but they'll always add the N word there. So my attacks when it comes to sexism will always be sprinkled with racism. It's never detached. Yeah. yeah. So intersectionality is very important. And I think those with most privilege in society have to take it more seriously than anybody because they're the ones that, if they're not careful, if they don't understand the identities people have, will be stepping constantly on people's heads. If it's not black women, it's brown women. If it's not brown women, it's trans women. You will constantly be stepping on people because you want to ignore parts of their identity that is integral to who they are. Yeah. It's a very interesting like um, understanding to think that you can fully detach power structure from one another and that would be a way of discussing reality kind of because exactly. it does not fit with how, like even in the work that we're doing with friends, we know that mm -hmm. uh, it's not ever solely that you're being subjected to bullying yeah. on the basis of racism. There's more things at play mm -hmm. always. Yeah. 
or other things that will determine your position. Yeah, yeah, and I think that is also, people don't understand that we can't just talk about racism as a separate thing. Sometimes racism manifests in different, different forms. And racism, I look at it like a big family. Racism is married to sexism, but their cousins are anti-blackness and colorism. You know, there are so many levels to this. I, during the Black Lives Matter um, movement here um, in Europe, I would say that a lot of white people are thinking, I get what racism is. And it's not just getting it, there are nuances within it. So just because you understand racism doesn't mean if you are in a position of power, when the time comes to pick the best person for a job, you won't pick according to colorism ideas or anti-blackness. And helping or raising the voices of POC does not necessarily mean that black voices are being raised as well. You know, hierarchies exist and you have to understand the whole family of racism, not just parts of it. Yeah. Very true. And uh, in your book, you discuss um, you discuss autism mm -hmm. and how you were subjected to bullying mm -hmm. uh, and feeling like an outsider mm -hmm. a lot of the time, not only like in primary school, but ac actually later as well. Yeah. Uh, do you want to get into that and how that affects you like intersectionally? Well, is there anything in particular that you feel you're interested in? Because I think intersectionally, um, my autism doesn't impact how people see me as much as being black and woman and Muslim, for example. But I think autism is something that impacts how I see the world, yeah. you know, how I communicate with the world. And it's not always something that makes it easy for people to understand me. Because with autism, there's a thing called double empathy, which means that I can have an easier time communicating with another person with autism on the scale, wherever they are, than I would with a person that doesn't have autism. It's like speaking to somebody who you don't share first language with. So I think that m creates a lot of issues for me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in various places, whether it's with black people or white people or brown people, people are always ready to misunderstand me and analyze who I am based on what they consider to be social codes. Right. And I don't understand social codes very well, not for white people, not for black people, not for academia, nowhere. So I will always make waves. And it used to make me very sad thinking, oh, I always cause trouble wherever I go. And now at 36, I'm like, I wasn't the problem. Right. Society is the problem for wanting somebody whose brain works differently in a, more, in a beautiful way as well to conform to these ideas that are so static that they suffocate you. Yeah, and I guess what I'm mostly interested in, like, and I don't want to spoil the book, but mm -hmm. there is a part where you talk to a doctor mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and there's a lot of misunderstanding as yeah. to who you are mm -hmm. and what you need, kind yeah. of. Uh, yeah. So I guess that's kind of where the misunderstandings in your life that's come as a result of people not seeing the full you. Yeah. Not the full me, and also there's no imagery. When I was diagnosed, I was in my um, early to mid 20s. So I had never heard of autism as being a, something that black women have. And autism is a funny little animal, as I call it, because it was created, you can only find out about autism if you think about it in terms of a white boy which means white women have a difficult time being diagnosed, but also what if you're a black woman? You're being diagnosed in accordance to rules and regulations set for a white man. And as hard as I try, I can never be a white man. So that just means you get no representation. You grow up not knowing how a black woman with autism is supposed to behave. You think you're insane, you think you're depressed, you think the world would be so much better if you weren't in it. And then you meet a doctor and you tell him I'm depressed and you have, all of these symptoms and he tells you, where are you from? And you say, Sweden. And he says, no, really, where are you from? And you say, oh, my mom's from Gambia. My dad's from Sierra Leone. My grandmother's from Mauritania. Is that what you mean? And he goes, oh, I've been to Kenya once. <laughs> and you go, I haven't. And he goes, your problem is not depression. You've eaten too much palm oil, you're fat. And you have to go through this process with him in England, spending money each time you go to the doctor and you just never get any help. So you lose weight, you come back and he's like, 
uh, you quit eating the palm oil I see. Uh, you know, in Kenya, we call it. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm depressed. I want to die. Help. And he just doesn't understand it until I met a black female doctor. And she was like, I don't think you're depressed. I think um, you're on the spectrum. And I said, heck no. Now the whole black community is going to say I'm insane. So it's just so many levels of right. hell that you just can't understand. And I'm still figuring it out. And I'm still speaking to parents with black kids who have autism, being fearful of how the world's going to treat them. Yeah. So it's complicated. Yeah, like you said, it's very layered. And uh, the reaction from everyone in society is going to be different, but it's you feel like it's not going to serve you, kind of. No. Not no. knowing who you are. Yeah. Um, so moving on, yeah. you gave us a lecture this mm -hmm. summer yeah. uh, when you talked about uh, Carl von Linné, who's actually from this city. <laughs> uh, and I mean... We knew parts of it, and there are some parts of his legacy that aren't as flattering as other ones. Mm -hmm. And so, I guess first of all, I just I just wanted to ask you why is it important to spread the word about his involvement with eugenics mm -hmm. and categorization of humans into race categories? Why is that important? What was important there is that I think we discussed this before even coming on stage is the fact that when we go to school. We learn about all the great things white men did, yeah. They did so many amazing things. But we never actually get to hear the full extent of what they've done. So we grow up thinking about Alfred Noble, he's done this. Oh, well, by the way, he was also involved in quite a lot of racist stuff. Uh, we talk about botanics and Carl von Linné and how he used to walk in gardens and sniff flowers. And we don't talk about his most long-standing legacy with race biology where he defines women like me as being over-sexualized creatures, lack of intelligence, temper problems, something that has led to, in 2020, why it's so easy for people to look at a passionate black woman and call them angry black women. That's from Carl. We can, we can thank Carl for that. Uh, we can thank him for many good things, but he has done far worse things based on his ignorance on humanity. And because we don't question, like we know his botanical, you know, uh, work is very, it's long lasting, is the reason why we don't eat certain flowers, you know, that's fine. But again, how about his work that's still living on today and harming people that look like me by helping create and maintain stereotypes that's leading to us being killed and raped. Why should we hide that part? If we're going to talk about how amazing white men are in history, let's also be honest about the truth of what they have done. And that includes genocide, holocaust, rape. That includes effects that still affect Sweden and how we see the word race and the structures that come with it. Why can't we talk about all sides of humanity and not just one part of humanity? And for speaking about the truth of Carl led to a lot of people being angry with me, threatening my life. One even tried to set my apartment on fire. That was fun at 3 a.m. in the morning. All because I want the truth of a white man's history. But every day you hear about every black person's worst history through, the, through the, that same lens. Why should one race be allowed forgiveness and whitewashing and another race is penalized? I don't understand, you know? So that was why it was important. You know, flowers, but we must also talk about the effects that affect women that look like me. Yeah, definitely. Hmm. And uh, as you said, it's, um It's kind of like this good bad binary. You you cannot take in that someone's not done everything perfectly when you have such an important historic figure as Carl von Linnea. Yeah. Uh, people get distress uh, from the fact that there might be parts of the legacy that's not mm. all positive. Yeah. Which is a very strange way of looking at humanity as a whole kind of because no such thing exists really. Exactly. Um, And I feel like if we continue to whitewash history, we're gonna repeat it over and over again. So me walking past a statue of Carl doesn't evoke any anger within me. Um, it just makes me understand why we are in this state in Sweden of denial. 
And I, I guess that's kind of the discussion I want to move on to. Mm -hmm. Like, what does it say about Sweden and who owns the history and the spaces in Sweden yeah. to have uh, monuments of people who have been part of creating a legacy mm -hmm. that still affects you today in terms mm -hmm. of racism? Yeah. What does that mean? I think we know who owns history. We know who rewrites history. We know who is orgasmic at the idea of being seen as a white savior. And it's not people that look like me, that's for sure. I think it says a lot about the state we are in where people will yell Black Lives Matter and put intersectional feminism on their bio on Instagram but do not understand who Carl von Linnea was. It's just everybody's so trigger happy to be woke, but some people are just sleepwalking. That's where we are. Mm -hmm. hmm. Moving on then <laughs> <laughs> from this uh, discussion. Uh, no, but it's, it's, uh, it's all connected, of course, mm -hmm. uh, in this new book mm -hmm. that you have, Strangers in, uh, in White Rooms, mm -hmm. I guess, if there is an English title. I think Stranger in White Spaces. In White Spaces, yeah. of course, yeah. yeah. Um, you discuss colorism mm -hmm. a lot and colorism being that people like myself mm -hmm. while of course also being subjected to racism um, on a scale mm -hmm. will be better off mm -hmm. and actually benefit mm -hmm. from racism yeah. in terms of in in relation to people with a darker tone yeah. um so do you want to get into why we need to have that discussion. We had a discussion beforehand yeah. and... I think it would be interesting once everybody reads that particular chapter of the book because I think you have and I haven't really... The whole entire book is I said what I said. And it was very much unapologetic because I, as a dark-skinned black woman, I think the only group of people under me on the hierarchy are black, dark-skinned trans women or persons with uh, disabilities. And it's very important and it's very fascinating to watch Sweden, England, America right now have the same discussion of colorism, which is, I don't know if anybody doesn't know what colorism is, it means that people of the same race and the same ethnicity are graded based on their skin tone. So Patrick and I have different skin tones, which most of you can see but we're also treated differently in society, meaning where in certain instances where I'm penalized, he would get benefit of the doubt. And that's not just between me and Patrick, that's between me and anybody who's lighter than me. And anybody who's darker than me, I probably have some sort of light skin privilege over them too. So black people aren't just one shade, we're 56 different shades, some of them lighter than even white people. So it's very important to talk about because I'm seeing this conversation happen in Sweden and I've seen it happen for four years where persons with lighter skin tones or mixed race heritage will get really upset at being told that you have something called light skin privilege because they don't know what that is or how it manifests. And then people with dark skin will get really angry, rightfully so, and then the conversation just implodes. And then we all go quiet and then six months again we bring it up. So I've seen this like touch and go happen, touch and go, where we're not meeting each other on the same level. And yes, we may all be black, mixed, whatever. But even Filipinos, the darker skin you are, the less privileges you have. In India, we understand that the darkest black Indians, they are at the bottom of the caste system. The only jobs they can take is cleansing public toilets. So we know colorism exists, we know how it manifests, but Sweden, People aren't understanding how it manifests. Like we can look at the demographics of Sweden. There are 400,000 Afro Swedes. Out of that, 30,000 are mixed race. Yet when you look at the media landscape, 90% are mixed race that are representing blackness. And that becomes a problem because, not because of them, because their family at the end of the day, but it, it, it makes you think who is allowed to gatekeep blackness? Not the people it affects the worst, but the people with privilege enough to be in white rooms because white people see them as somewhat better than people like me. You know, where a mixed race person may be called in instead of me, they're thinking, well, at least Levette's so angry, we don't want her here. Not that I want to be there anyway, because <laughs> I think people, white people are angry, you know? Um, history has taught us that. And 
it just makes you think like how how can we not analyze our own customs our own communities and give each other space like we want white people to give us space to speak and be who we are but we amongst ourselves are kind of not giving each other the same forgiveness and the same understanding and the same challenges um but I also think we have issues intercommunally that we must bring up. We must be brave enough to talk about and not beat each other bloody when we talk about it. Yeah. And it's like we were saying before that Sweden is such a young country when it comes to like it's having not. discussions of race. Not a young country. Listen, they created the discussions I know, of race. I know, I know. I'm just saying <laughs> the young. rediscussion of this. Yeah. And the discussion of it as a social phenomenon that still affects people yeah. is very young. Yeah. Whereas when we get into these discussions around colorism, people feel like you're dividing the movement. Yeah. Whereas now I've found a space where I can yeah. connect with people. And now you're taking that away, Lovett. Why would you do I'm that? I'm not taking... Well, I think, I think that's one of the issues that people have had with me because... Like I told you, when I, I have a platform and it's, a, a, you know, hundreds of thousands of people tune in and watching discuss. And I was like, next week I'm going to talk about colorism with special guests. <laughs> Black people were like, um, excuse you? You're going to do what? And one of them even said to me, white people are going to laugh at us. And I said, they're already laughing <laughs> because we have, we have our own issues. They're not laughing at us because we want to deal with these and discuss these things, mm -hmm. they're laughing because they're in power right now. And we cannot, we are as strong as the weakest person in the group, which means if we continue to silence dark-skinned women who see and feel the brunt of, uh, of white supremacy every day, how much better are we? Because people forget in every hierarchy, there are mini hierarchies. Right. So in brown people's hierarchies, there's hierarchies based on class, on race, or, oh, sorry, on ethnicity, and light skin privilege there as well. So we have to be able to talk about these things and not just in safe rooms, not just in separatist groups, but openly because on my platform, there are people that watch that who are heads at companies I'm not gonna mention, who DM'd me and said, you know what, you're right, because every single uh, model that we've hired has been you know, mixed race. Mm -hmm. And we have never understood why we, we are doing that. Right. But we should be thinking about that. Or the highest that they do are people that they deem to be, you know, 50% one of us and 50% we don't know. Like, it's, it, they're the ones dividing. We just have to fix the mess now because it's affecting us, you know? And these conversations aren't new. Black people aren't new to Sweden. But listen, if you can create race biology, you can, you can allow black people to talk about it. We can't give them no more excuses, no more passes. <laughs> we got to fix this. Yeah, yeah, very much true. And yeah. like, it's a nuanced discussion that's been lacking for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And it's something that uh, I feel as a mixed person that we've not taken the responsibility of speaking about enough. Yeah. And um, I would like you all to take more responsibility so I don't get threatened anymore. <laughs> yes. We yeah. Do that. Thank you. <laughs> um, and... So yesterday, mm -hmm. I watched a film uh, that was called Mothers Of, mm -hmm. and it's part of uh, Cinema Africa's festival. So shout, shout out, out to uh, Samad Girma and the people that's in yes. Africa. Yeah. And it was talking about um, radical self-care mm. and finding space to within your activism and within all of the things that you're taking on, mm -hmm. um, being able to find a sustainable way of doing all of that mm -hmm. and uh, a few weeks back you wrote uh, or you went out on your social medias and talked about the end of your activism so yeah. i guess i want to ask you uh, how does one do activism in a sustainable way and how would you um if you were to talk to mm -hmm. young black people yeah young black girls mainly yeah uh, how would you address them and advise them to take on their activism? I don't think activism for black people is sustainable. I think the radicalism in activism is to be able to rest, not just go according to what capitalism says you should do, do, do. Because black women, we stand up for everybody. Like if you go through my platform seven years, there isn't one group of people I haven't been at the forefront like championing. As long as they're marginalized, I'm there. And black women do that every day. We want to save every Tom, Dick, and Harry. 
and their grandparents and their grandkids because we're so used to being we're so used to being the stereotypically strong person that we as black women do not understand that it's a trap. They need us to be strong so they can be weak. And white people and brown people need to stop stepping on black women's shoulders. I see that during all the years of activism, even when I'm taking a bath and I accidentally open my mobile phone, someone will, will be like, oh well, you are Kim Lundell har gjort det här, kan du prata om det? I'm like, Anders, du kan prata om det här. You know, how about you do that? Because that's not my problem, is it? But before, I would just do everything. You will send me something, so-and-so said the N-word. Then it's my job to educate them. And then, along the way, you forget that you're also a human being. That you're also flesh and blood. You allow people to dehumanize you by giving you a title of an activist when you're also Levette the human being. You should be able to have the freedom and the power to pick your battles and know when you need to take a step back. Because activism is not a pretty sight. There are external factors that affect your well-being. You also then have to go out in real life and be treated like a black woman on the streets of Sweden. And then you also have a family and you have a friends. If you ask my mum, I can be in my home for weeks without seeing another human being because I'm constantly working. My brother will call me and say, let's hang out. And I'll be like, I don't have time because I have a lecture. Then I have to do this Instagram live. Then I have to do that. It's about picking ourselves first because nobody's going to pick us first. So we have to pick ourselves. Not even black men will pick us first. So we have to pick ourselves. We have to set boundaries and be radical at the boundaries we set and be prepared that we will be hated for the boundaries that we set because I see... People in my black community hate me because I set clear boundaries. You mess around, you get blocked out of all my spaces. You spread rumors and lies. You get blocked out of all of my spaces. So it's just, I think I wouldn't advise any black person to be an activist because I also know it's not a choice. Because we don't speak because we want to be activists. We speak because we have to speak and survive. So for black girls, it's just Always pick yourself first in every battle. And when you feel like you have to speak, speak according to your own terms. Don't let anybody, not even another black person, set that standard for you. Because you know you and your limits. And the last thing we need are more black women activists dying at 37. Killing ourselves. Because sometimes the mental stress is too much. And you can see statistics upon statistics you know, from Eric Garner's sister who took up activism when her own brother was killed. She just died. We, every week I hear about an activist I respect that's dying. And that's what I said, I'm not going to break my back anymore for people that won't break a nail for me. I'll educate. And then it's up to anybody to take that info and do with it as they wish. But for black girls, for black women, pick yourself first, please. Yeah. Well, and uh, I think like about the option to activism mm -hmm. would of course be silenced then. I th feel like we're almost back to it. your silence will not protect you and the need for you to speak up for yourself, but doing it at a level where you also get a respite from time to time. I think speaking, like I said, I may not be an activist, but that doesn't mean I'm going to be quiet about things that affect me or, or people that I care about or my country, which Sweden is, it's almost that you have to pick battles and know that you have the energy reserves to handle it. Because I know when I finish certain battles, I'm out for the count for a month. Sometimes people won't see me online for months and they'll be like, oh, she's quit. No, I, I literally have nothing more to give. I have to have space. So this, the opposite of activism is not silence, it's accountability. Why should it just be on black women to save the world? It must be on everybody with those. The more privilege you ha have, the more accountability I demand. And we should be demanding. So when protest time comes, I don't want to see just black women at the forefront because we know white bodies ain't going to get touched by the police. Put yourself there. Be an ally. Be next to me. Be in front when it's required. Don't be silent. Their silence is not going to protect them, is what I'm saying, because we're getting tired. Yeah. Yes, all of that. And um, so you spoke a little bit about it already, but 
kind of the hate that you've received in social media. And uh, there was a quote in your book in which I've translated. Um, yeah, so you bear with me. Mm -hmm. uh, you become Levette the activist rather than Levette the human. Uh, if on top of that you're black, it makes it that much easier for people to dehumanize you. And um, so I guess I just wanted to uh, hear your thoughts on receiving hate online and what that means for your energy levels and uh, for... Yeah. I think, you know, you work with bullying issues as well. I think hate online has just become commonplace for most people. I've had to speak to students, white, black and brown, and they tell you, you know, when the bullying goes on and their classmates put their pictures on Snapchat, how it affects them. And they are just going to one school and are dealing with one class. Then you look at me, somebody who never chose to be a public person because I'm the most antisocial person you probably will find. Suddenly people are creating ideas of who you are and hating you based on it. And it's not even based on facts. It can, it can drive people to suicide. It can drive people to kill themselves. And it has. We see that everyday public people, persons killing themselves. And I'm no different from them because I've had my moments where I'm like, is this even worth it? Should I just die? Because you've seen these messages Upon e these messages, die, lynch yourself, shoot yourself, you will get shot, you should get raped. And you're just like, wow, one person can evoke all of these negative feelings in people who have never met you. And you ask yourself, why? So social media has made it so easy to just attack anybody and not think that if you met that person in real life, you would never open your mouth in the same way. I think social media has made it very easy to spread lies. We see that with, you know, Trump. Um, but you also see that with regular people that, you know, you'd be surprised. And I like accountability. So when I go online and I see a family member or a friend writing things that I'm like, yo, I will call them and be like, why are you writing this under Afton Blades Commentage Felt? You do know you have a black friend and family member, right? But I don't think everybody does that. I don't think people hold those around them accountable for what they do online either. You know, I have my mom. She will smack my mobile out of my hand. And she's logged on all of my platforms. So she knows when I'm misbehaving, as in just, you know, going off on a rant or something. But most people don't have my mom, who is very, you know, has oversight on everything that's happening and hold you accountable. And I feel that's a bit sad because we don't know what our friends and families are doing online anymore until we hear someone kill themselves. And then boom, you might just realize that your family member was involved in that ab abuse that they were receiving. What do you think it is that people are so scared of just the calling out of, of people? Well, I can't speak for other people. I don't know what people are scared of, but I know I'm scared of some people, definitely, mm. yeah. Because it, it's interesting because you have societies in which like the communal way of raising people is commonplace kind of, whereas here we have a normalized way of just not calling people out when they do things that we like, we will feel like it's wrong, yeah. but it's not worth my energy to call them out for doing so. Mm. And that becomes a danger in the long run. Yeah. It's and I think I write that in my book because there's a socio psychological um, theory called the spiral of silence by Elizabeth New Newman. And it, I think that's what happens a lot in Sweden because we're ruled by Jantelagen, which is, you know, nobody's better than anybody else. But also if you see somebody being harmed, keep your mouth shut and keep walking because you don't want the smoke. And the spiral of silence is basically that people who say and write destructive things online say it because even people who see it and remain silent are giving them power to continue. But when you actually ask the question like, why are you talking like that about Patrick, what proof do you have? You're making them have to prove what they're saying and that stops people a lot more than if you just let someone say, oh, Patrick's horrible at his job and Patrick is this and Patrick is nine foot eight or whatever. If you don't question people on why they're writing and saying certain things, you're also giving them, you know, a laissez pass to continue doing what they're doing. And that's something I have been, you know, a victim of, where someone will say, oh, Levette is this. And 
nobody will say anything against it. And then it will spiral and spiral and spiral until it reaches a point where now they're claiming Levette has put babies in a container and taken them to X country. And still nobody's questioning it. They and just like, yeah, you know, maybe I'm not going to talk about it because also in our community, people understand that if you defend Levette or if you defend this person, you're next. Yeah. They're going to turn it on you. Right. And nobody wants to be in that position of just getting hate and hate and hate and accusations yeah. for nothing. It's uh, like Sarah Ahmed wrote about uh, if you name the problem, you become the problem. Yep. Which is kind of what this is. Yeah. And in bullying research, we talk a lot about uh, bystander effects, yeah. uh, which is that people feel like if no one else is speaking up, then I don't have to either. Mm -hmm. And um, like the way I normally describe school cult culture is around, uh, so if you have a group of friends standing mm -hmm. around, mm -hmm. one of them cracks a racist joke, mm -hmm. and the rest of them, um, no one else like intervenes or says anything. That means that it's accepted within the school culture yeah. to crack racist jokes. Exactly. But if people will endorse this by uh, laughing along and mm -hmm. so on, that means that it's something that's actually giving you social status. Yeah. So more and more people will do so. And that goes into social medias as well. Yeah. If there is a way for you to put a comment on Lovett's uh, Instagram, mm -hmm that's hurtful in some way and mm -hmm. people will like that and means pe more people do it. Yeah. So. Uh, and I used to, I noticed something funny. Back in the day when I started social media, seems like a million years ago, if I get like a hate mail, I would post it just to show people that this is not acceptable. The more I post it and show the hate I got, the more people sent hate. And then came a moment where my mom was like, give me the job. I will scan your, your Instagram and your Facebook and your Twitter. 6 a.m. every morning, so you wake up at 7.30, all the hate mail is gone. So that's what my mom used to do. She would actually wake up and do that because it was getting to me. Then it started getting to her. Then I had to bring in an assistant. She's like, it's bad enough to know that you get hate, but as your mom, I still see you as my baby, and I see people want to hurt my baby. So I was just like, yeah, we get an assistant. They're not connected to us by blood. They'll just block and delete. Yeah, so that was the solution. Yeah. And the fact that you have to like have someone be the kind of the wall in between or the shield before you even walk, wake up in the morning is <laughs> part of a bigger problem in Sweden and in the yeah. world. Yeah. Uh, and I think Amnesty released a report, I think it was called Troll Patrol. And it shows that women like myself who, who are public people on, online, we get 85% more hate than white women who do anything else and are public. So a white woman with the same amount of platform of like half a million spread out, I get 85% more hate than her simply for being black and female. And people, when you see activists, in, white activists in Sweden write their insender artiklar, they're just saying, oh, gud, stackars oss kvinnor. They don't say, men det finns, there's levels of hell to this. Which means if I get this much hate, black women get even more, 85% more. So people aren't being honest about the reality either. People I expect to be truthful are not when they get the opportunity to dis disseminate this information um, in media, they will make it woe is me as a woman rather than realizing different women have different woe is me as well. So it becomes denial and that's where intersectionality comes in because if I'm supposed to write an article about anything, I'm always going to add that but also trans women who are dark skinned are less privileged than me because there's levels to it. It's nuanced and people don't want that nuance. Yeah. It's really interesting, and uh, yeah. So we had a, a quick discussion beforehand mm -hmm. about kind of a lacking discussion in uh, in Sweden mm -hmm. about race being situational and being mm -hmm. contextualized, mm -hmm. and how we, having grown up in different contexts, mm -hmm. like I myself, mostly grew up in Sweden, but lived in Kinshasa for a while during my upbringing, mm -hmm. and coming across and understanding myself mm -hmm. in those racial terms changed me kind of. Yeah. So do you want to get into what that means as a contextual? Do you want to give me more of an apple to go by? Because yes. this could, this could spoil <laughs> a hood. This could like, 
Yeah, um, l- let's limit it for my autistic <laughs> brain, please. <laughs> okay. Um, the problem is that sometimes you will feel like, okay, so you're black and you're always black. But there are layers to this. And you are, of course, in terms of colorism that yeah. we've discussed, kind yeah. of. But colorism for me made something meant something different when I came to Congo. Yeah. Because I was instantly... Uh, I understood that I was more pri- privileged in this context. Yeah. In terms of like meeting my cousins, I understood yeah. that they look up to me and yeah. they value me more because of my lighter shade. What you just said is profound for me because I have cousins who moved to Gambia when I was young. And I saw how our teachers at school treated my mixed race um, cousins where in school, if I got less on a mat, like the rule was, if you got below 50%, you're going to get caned, which means you get hit on the hang. And I always wondered, how come my mixed race cousins who are in the same class never get caned? Mm. So me being a loudmouth girl, I was like, sir, why didn't they, they got 42%. I wanted them to get caned. Um, And the teacher was like, their skin is more sensitive. They could not afford to beat the mixed race kids because they would get really wrecked. Yeah, and I was like, hey, <laughs> I'm also pink on the inside. Mm. Like, what are you saying? Right. And I complained to my grandmother because I was like, the white kids, we had four of them in Mrs. Naos in Gambia. They don't get caned. They never get hit. They never had to do the monkey dance, which was you have to do um, sit-ups like at school. You would have to cross your hands and then you bend up and down like 300 times. Like things that gymnasts don't even have to do, Mm. you know? And I was just like, why don't the white kids get that and the mixed kids get that, but we get that? Because our teacher who was blacker than me was valuing people based on race. So things like that always make me question because as an autistic child, I never look up or look down on anybody, but I like to analyze why people do the things they do, much to the annoyance of my teachers, because I want to question everything. And I remember speaking to my grandmother about it, and she was very, like, my grandmother doesn't, she worked with Swedish people back in the, you know, 50s, so she definitely does not value whiteness as anything special. And she was just like, I will speak to Mrs. Nau, who is the um, principal, because if you get king for 45%, they should all get king, or nobody gets caned. So she took up that conversation, and I was never caned since. I got light skin privilege. So that's the anecdote I would like to share with you today. Thank you. But, but everything else was a, was a mess because I think even in, when we were like in our early teens, my mixed race cousins would get boyfriends and all of that whilst I was always like, you know, the third wheel, which suited me just fine. Um, but it was peculiar to see the desirability politics of they had nice hair and I had, you know, like 4C type hair, which is amazing, by the way. But I just didn't see how people could value all of these things. Then I came to Sweden and it clicked. It didn't click in Gambia, it clicked here. When I realized that this social construct that my grandmother told me about, because when I was leaving um, Gambia, and I always talk about this, my grandmother said something at the airport. She said, all my cousins went in and she pulled me back. She was like, you're going to Sweden, you're going to be with your mom. I want you to remember one thing. And I was like, what? What? And she says, no matter how long a stick is in the river, it will never be a crocodile. So what she meant was, you is black, you will remain black, you will die black. So don't try to be a white person. And that was a lesson I lost coming to Sweden because I in- internalized a lot of the hatred I got. I bleached my skin for 10 years to be lighter without really understanding what that really meant. So when I came out of that, I made a video that went viral and was played on BBC Africa, talking about how it impacts your mind, being around white people all the time. But white people never get that. It's not contextualized for them, because they go to Africa, they look upon as higher. In Sweden, they're already higher. Mm. There isn't any country in the world that doesn't value whiteness as a sign of beauty or gives you privilege. So that's why reverse racism doesn't exist as well, but it's really hard for white people to understand. Mm. Yeah, very, very hard. So it's contextualized for us, but whiteness, wherever it goes, Asia, Africa, Middle East, is always higher up. Yeah. Right. Mm.
I'm opening up for questions from the floor. And yep. also thank you for... Thank you, everything. Patrick. This yeah. won't be the last conversation we have, I'm sure. I'm well, glad. <laughs> <laughs> so any questions and make it hard. We have to repeat okay, the questions repeat as well. Question. Yeah. So I have a daughter um, that's six years old and she does not want to be black uh, because she's been told that black people are ugly and and therefore she does not want to be black. So the question is, how do I deal with this? Yeah. Um, first of all, I don't have any kids, but I love kids. Um, I think this is where I feel like people like you and my mom, they, this is having to protect your child from whiteness as a parasite. And I'm not saying white people are parasite. I'm saying whiteness as a social construct is parasitic. It enters your mind and it makes you hate everything that you are. You as a black mother have to make sure your entire house is filled with books of dark skinned, beautiful black children. Um, you have to monitor what she watches on that television show because Trust me, even Bobby sneaks in a little bit of anti-blackness there every now and then. You have to make sure every single day she doesn't leave your house without you telling her how beautiful her black skin is. You have to be her barrier against all the hate because when you have a child, which is why I don't have some, this is your full-time job now until she actually manifests her own personality and understanding. You have to sit down and talk to her about whiteness as a social construct. You have to explain to her how whiteness as a social construct needs every single human being who is not white to be on their knees so it can feel tall. And it only does that by erasing your history, by erasing and disintegrating everything that your daughter is. Other than that, you're gonna have big problems the older she gets because that self-hatred only gets stronger. So you have to be the mother that, you know, you can be. And when in doubt, Auntie Levette's always ready to pop in. You know, tell me what school she's in, like text me. <laughs> I'll have a word or two. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like for myself that I was blessed with the fact that my family started this African Film Association when I was a kid. So I was able to see black faces. I was around to be around a lot of people yeah. that valued these things and saw that it was necessary for us to have that around us. Exactly. And I think that that is something that could also be like yeah. helpful to have. Yeah. Uh, so again, yeah. shout out to Cinema Africa. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So let me just go all black all day, every day, like only Gambians can do sometimes. Just make your house all black, make it her safe space. Let her watch YouTube videos of little dark skinned girls doing their hair. You literally have to overfeed her to overcompensate for what society teaches us, you know? Control what she consumes and have a word with that school, please. Yeah, yeah. And also like in terms of how, uh, I guess this question wasn't really addressed to me, but <laughs> like, yeah. I work with bullying, so. <laughs> oh, you just go for yeah. it. Yeah, no, uh, like it's a good thing that she's telling you this. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people do. Like sometimes you will internalize it and feel like this is something that I had to bear myself. And coming to your own family and telling them that someone said that blackness is ugly mm -hmm. will be a slight on your whole family as well. Mm -hmm. So people will feel reluctant to coming home and talking about the racism that they are treated yeah. with. Yeah. So. Next question. So the question I got now is, since you've lived in other European countries, how do you rate being black in different cities. Um, I'll tell you that it's, um, if I compare Sweden to England, it's definitely worse being in Sweden because in England, with its history of transatlantic slave trade and actually building a whole empire on black bodies, there is more of a willingness to have that conversation. In Sweden, we try to say, well, we've never had slaves. Well, we did have colonies, though. Uh, we, we don't have the word race, even though we created race biology. Um, like, there's a lot of things Swedish people do as a culture, not individuals, but as a culture, that makes it difficult for a black person to even say, ouch, that hurts. Like, there is no andrum. The moment you try to talk about race, you become the problem. So people say, oh, I don't see color. And you go, then you don't see me. But it just continues. I think if I have to rank living in Sweden compared to England, compared to Germany or Paris, Sweden takes the cake and Denmark takes the cake. Finland, like the Nordic countries take the cake 
because here we are so used to the whole world seeing us as better than in socialism, for example, that we can't imagine that black people aren't happy here. And we're like, what? We have high taxes and you get free schooling and you get free healthcare. Racism doesn't happen here. You should be happy, you should be grateful and shut up. So I think that's more of the attitude in Sweden where you should just shut up and take it because you should be grateful that you're even here whether than, than somewhere else. But I left Sweden when I was 19 and a half because Sweden was, whiteness as a construct was strangling all of the air in my body, my lungs, my soul. I had to go to the closest country I could run to, England. And I stayed there for 10 years because I saw people that looked like me. And I don't mean me as in light skin versions. I saw versions of me in all shades, 56 shades, being lawyers, being doctors, being barristers, being their authentically black selves, something that I never saw in Sweden. I never turned on the TV and saw anybody that looked like me growing up. Not even Alice Ba, to be honest. They don't look like me. They don't speak like me. They don't think like me. I was a stranger in Sweden from day the plane landed until I left England. It's now that I'm making Sweden my B-I-T-C-H. Like, it's now I'm saying, I don't need Swedish people to accept me. I'm here and I'm gonna continue to be here, and y'all take my taxes, so y'all gonna like me here. That's where I am now. Ni kommer älska mig oavsett vad. Och gör ni inte det får ni gå ur vägen, but I'm still gonna be here. Det nu jag vågar och har pondus att kunna säga, jag hör hemma här. Att folk, vissa ser mig som främling spelar ingen roll. Men jag, är, jag kommer aldrig vara en främling i Sverige igen. Yeah. You know? Vi ses på nationaldagen i min folkdräkt. Like, we're gonna get down. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the Black Eyed Tuesday in Sweden and how it came across? I think it's very performative. I think it was very much a let's do a Black Eyed Tuesday, then we don't have to do any more work. We don't have to hire black people. We can just say we did Black Eyed Tuesday. Typical Swedish. Yeah. So I don't see a lot of effects. The effects are coming now that people are calling out companies who Black Eyed Tuesday and having looked over the homo homogenous workplace they've created or how they interact with black people or black Swedes, I think the effects are coming now where people are like, okay, what happened after the black square? What happened after Blackout Tuesday? Are you educating yourself? Because everybody went out and bought anti-racist books. Nobody's read it. They just put it to the bestseller list, but nobody's read it. So it's a lot of performative and smoke and mirrors whilst we need people to do more. And we've been asking for allies for 400 years. We're not asking for allies anymore because if in 2020 you're not an ally, you are like 300 years past it. We need accomplices. We need people to stand up and feel what we're feeling and not just empathize, but do something about it. So, I mean, I think allies is a word that we should just remove because we don't need allies anymore. We need people to clean up their S-H-I-T. Yeah. Yeah. I agree <laughs> on <laughs> on a big, but then I, what I've seen in my work mm -hmm. space is that um, come June, mm -hmm. a lot of kids who had been subjected to racist bullying in schools started speaking up and writing to us and came in with their stories. Yeah. And that is because adults were now, yeah. well, discussions were forced kind of. Yeah. So it for a little while yeah. created a space where people were emboldened to actually speak up about mm -hmm. the racism that they received. So I feel and like I that. And I think that is the only positive effect. Mm -hmm. But again, it's on us, the marginalized, to continue speaking exactly. out even louder. Like I've seen a lot of uh, marginalized communities um, and especially marginalized black communities speak out after Blackout Tuesday because we are emboldened. Right. We've been more emboldened than ever before because we're mm. realizing this is a global scale. There's a global problem. We're not alone. If your child is going through that in school, they know that a child in America and England and Denmark is going through it because they've seen the protest. Mm. So I think it's more of we're realizing that we're all as black people interconnected despite any country divisions. And that is emboldening us. We're knowing we're not alone globally. Exactly. And yeah. Well, 
this might spiral, yeah. but just go on. that. <laughs> just go on. Right. If they're tired, they can just switch off the cameras. Right. But you we're can, not You tired. can leave if we get yeah. too rowdy. Yeah, if you yeah. want to leave, it's fine. Just You can just like So what out. I want to say is yeah. that what forces this is a black man in the United States mm -hmm. dying at the hands of the police. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it being in the United States mm -hmm. made it safe for people to take part in this. If this was something that happened in Sweden, mm -hmm. people would be more reluctant to take part in this because it becomes a bigger issue. It comes too close to yourself. I don't know if I agree with that because I remember, um, I think it was 2019, January, there was a pregnant eight month old, uh, eight month pregnant woman, Janine. And that spiral all over Istanbul, that spiral to Germany, that spiral to England, Everybody knew what was happening in Sweden because of that incident that I was the, the manager of or project manager. I was involved in it, basically, the legal work behind it and the social media strategy as well. So I don't know if it's because it's America, because we have examples in England. We've been, we've been marching for Shukri Abdi, a young schoolgirl that went to school and was killed in a racist attack. Mm. And the police didn't want to investigate it. She was mm. a young Somali girl. So there are many names. I don't think it's just one name that sparked it because the BLM has been gaining momentum. Of course, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Patrice has been doing an amazing job. She started, you know, BLM in America. And I just feel like the whole world is now seeing that black lives need to matter. Black lives need to matter. And you don't want us to get any louder because we've been asking to value our lives same as white people. But now that is gonna change to be like, it must be as important as all lives. We, I mean, the discussion is just gonna get more and more. So all the good companies and the Blackout Tuesday participators that want to do something, they better do something tangible in real life, not just a symbolic one, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Any white people want to ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a makeup artist, and uh, a lot of the work that you are basing on is, sorry, I didn't hear. You wanted to know about your academic, academic background. background. Yes. Yeah, okay, so I mean, how far back do I go? In Gambia, I was, I have a very high privilege in Gambia. My grandmother, we're upper middle class. So I had private education in Gambia. So I went to private schooling. And when I came home, I had Quran school and I had, you know, Sunday school. And I also had maths because I was terrible at that. So I had private tutors as well as school. And then I had afternoon studies. So my whole upbringing to 11 years old was basically study, study, study. Because my grandmother said, beauty fakes, intelligence stays. And I said, look, I got both. But she never thought that was a funny joke. So I'm, I don't even know why I took that again. But she was very much invested in my education. I came to Sweden and it turned out I was far ahead than any of my classmates. So they put me a few classes higher. And everybody just wanted to play in Sweden, but I wanted to study. So I graduated quite early than my class because I was bumped up a class as well. And then I chose international baccalaureate because I wanted to get out of Sweden as soon as I could. So I picked an English um, college level. And then I went to Stockholm University. I did psychology and a little bit of law. And then I quit that and I went to England where I did property and law. So that goes together, which means I'm not a lawyer as in human rights, but I am very knowledgeable. I'm a lawyer in terms of property, commercial property like this and negotiations. And then I have several diplomas. Makeup artistry is one of them, but I also have diplomas, um, a few in human rights and some in property rights as well. So I continue educating myself. And next year, I'm hopefully going back to university to get my law degree here in human rights, finally. Jeez, yeah, so that's my, that's my background-ish, yeah. What do the, you suggest people study that want to make a change? Law. It's good to know the law, because we know we need more lawyers. Yeah, we need more people of color in every sphere. So if you want to be a psychologist, kudos to you. We, have a, we need you. Um, but I would say to make a change, you can be a dishwasher and you can be a barrister. Making a change in the world is not based on your academic background because I've seen a lot of people who've never set foot in school being written down in history as people that made changes. If you look at Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou, a lot of us have had difficulties in academia because of one thing or another. So don't 
don't buy the lies that white people tell you that you need degrees because you can be successful and make lots of changes without one degree. Just read a lot, educate yourself. That's all I can say. I know schools won't like me saying that, but you know, um, yeah, it's the truth. I would be doing what I'm doing if I wasn't, didn't go to university because I've changed careers dramatically, you know? What do you have to say about the relationship between racism and capitalism? I think um, capitalism enables racism just like every other problematic um, structure in society does. Capitalism just, it makes us work to the bones, but who works the most? You know, I think we were discussing this because my mom used to work in a commune and she was underpaid and she had to go through racist people day in and day out. So when she finally got, you know, psychologically utmattad, exhausted, um, and quit the job, they had to hire three white people to do her one black woman's job and pay them twice the amount that she was being paid. That shows you how capitalism kills us from the day we were cotton picking up until now. Black people and brown people are going into positions of work being underpaid. And if you're a woman, it's even worse. So what does that tell you? Capitalism is a structure just like, you know, racism and sexism. They all sleep in the same bed each night and have a threesome. Yeah. So how do I, as a person who came from Africa uh, five or six years ago, find my space within the discussions around racism in Sweden? Is, is that it? Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, and you did mention you like, you know, you're coming into contact with this for the first time. One thing, being an African myself, um, who has spent 10 years in Africa, 10 years in Sweden, 10 years in England, Racism exists in Africa. White people are, are still plundering, you know, from the mobiles we use to everything. It's just that maybe we are blinded by, you know, the white privilege that we are not having these discussions. I noticed because a few weeks back I was working in Lebanon and getting home Gambian people back to Gambia who were trafficked. Um, and I remember speaking about the racism Lebanese people enact in Gambia. And I realized how, how scared the Lebanese people were in Gambia that I was talking about how many women they rape, how many people they, they plunder, and they're still making money in businesses. Yet when black women go to Lebanon, we are sold into slavery pretty much. So when I was getting my people home, I realized how little, how, my video of 40 minutes educated, I think that video made the rounds of 780,000 people. 90% of them were from the African continent. People started speaking out. So when you ask me where do I stand, I look at it as where do you stand as a black man, which should be always supporting our liberation because our liberation is your liberation. Um, it's always not waiting to speak about because if you're new to Sweden or you came here four years ago, structures are still punishing you every day. Whether you see them or you don't, it unilaterally affects all black people. It's not a choice. So I would say, don't, don't ask, where do I fit in? You see something, you say something. You want to talk about something? Be in the middle of the party and be like, shut down the music. I just want to say structural racism. Um, is, can you hear me? Yeah, structural racism is the reason why I'm not getting paid at work. Talk about it anywhere. And that's why I can't work for people, because I'll say that anywhere, in the library even. Wait till I leave this stage. Yeah. No, just, just take, take uh, the discussion. Don't let anybody gatekeep. If you feel you want to talk, talk, but never talk above somebody who's below you in the hierarchy. So if a black woman's saying something that harms them, never be that guy that comes in and says, yeah, but I never see it, or my friends never rape, or my friends never grope. Listen and understand, because you also have power as man above us, in Africa and outside. So we need you to sometimes listen and just push us up. So I've been in Sweden for seven years, and I've uh, come across a lot of strange situations in, in which I've been mistreated in my account. And I'm wondering, is this a coincidence? Kind of. First of all, it's not your fault. You're just um, exhibiting empathy, which is a human em emotion, but many humans lack the way of showing it. You care a lot. This won't be the last time you'll get in trouble. And I've been getting in trouble I'm 36 now, so 36 years I've been getting in trouble since I started talking. Um, it's 
it's okay. I want you to do bear in mind though that you may need to get support from people that look like you that can give you that emotional support, whether it's, you know, from the same country as you come from or just from your family. You need to not internalize that harmful thoughts because you can't keep saying, oh, well, I stand up for people and I get shit for it. Join the club. We're in the same club. Like, I've been fired from work because I've told my coworker in a corporate environment, don't touch my ass or don't call me the N-word. And I've been the one who's been let go, not the man that's done that. So it's not you. I've been evicted as well. Because I said, why, why, how, come, how come you only hire two, two white people? And he didn't like it. So it was like, well, now the only black person's got to go out. And that was in England. So you will always be penalized as the problem when you point out the issue. You, it's easier to say you're the problem than to say you are part of the problem, like the person doing it. So I would just say, don't lose that part of yourself because who knows, you, you might just be a human rights activist in the making. You know, you, you could be a CEO in the making. What do I know? All I know is that you have potential. You're, 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 you're practicing your vocal cords and your humanity so you don't lose it. The people I fear are those that are so quiet that they lose their humanity because they fear everything because they don't want to be seen as you and I are maybe seen. So I would say, nah, it's not you. Go home, move back to your parents, chill out for a bit, eat some food, dust yourself off and try again like Aliyah said. You got to do that. You can't internalize that because internalizing that is the reason I bleach my skin permed my hair is the reason I would come home and cry and not be able to leave my home for months because I feel like, oh my God, if 10 people tell me that I'm the problem, then I must be a horrible person. Internalizing that shit is the reason in 2010 I tried to kill myself. So no, don't internalize the hate. Leave it where it belongs and keep fighting in this life because you're strong, you're beautiful, you're intelligent. Mate, if you gotta wake up every morning like I do and stand in the mirror and be like, who's the man? You're the man. Who's the best? Like, it sounds silly, but I do things like that sometimes to pep myself up because this world will break you down and you cannot be part of the breaking down of yourself. You are all you've got. And if you could have one more person, count yourself luckier than most. Some of us have only got the mirror, you know? So say nice things to yourself, yeah. How common was it for Gambian women to be part of politics in, or well, be politicians, I should say, in the 50s? She was one of the first. She's also the first woman. Um, the story of my grandmother, someday I'll write a book about her because she's fascinating. She is one of, was it seven kids, mom? Her sibling, no, she was one of 13 children and she was the oldest and she was married off at 13. She had her first child at 14, second one at uh, 15. Both of them died. My mom is uh, the third child, surviving child. And she was one of the first women to divorce in court in Gambia that bypassed all of the Muslim laws. So you can tell she did not give a F. And when she came into politics, only men were allowed to speak. So on rallies, women were just cheerleaders and just be like, well done, well said. And she would stand in the middle of the meeting and she would speak about women's rights. She would ride horses with the men into the villages when need be, no saddle, so bareback. Um, she was a hardcore woman and she did this for 30 years until we had a new government, uh, a coup d'etat. Stats coup? Yeah. Odor Vavi Ifara, we were in, in, we were at risk of being raped and killed because they were killing a lot of the political families, including like my grandmother's friends. So my grandmother said she was gonna stay in Gambia, kill her or not, she's gonna not leave her house. But all her grandkids went to our parents who were in England, in Sweden. We had to come because she couldn't risk our lives. That's how I ended up in Sweden. But she was very rare. But one story that I know that uh, one of her friends told me when she passed away, when your grandmother entered the arena, Nobody dared speak against her. She was a rhetorics as expert. But more than that, she loved people. So if she meets you, she doesn't see your color. She's maybe one of few people, I'll say, will not see color. She doesn't think you're better than. She will take you as you are. What you say, what you do, 
your morals and your ethics. And so far in my life, I've never met a human being like her. You know, I've seen her put her body during the, the coup d'etat between her grandchild and the military's guns pointed at her. And the military guns had to sink themselves and bring it down because she was not budging. You would shoot her, but she wasn't going anywhere. So if there ever was a magical human being, it would be her. And it's probably not rare when you look at her heritage, her ancestry. She had to give up a lot. And she had to take back a lot, teach herself how to read and write so she could monitor our homework because she was married off. When her siblings were learning one, two, three, and ABC, she was a wife pregnant. And, you know, I, she died in 2014 on Christmas Eve. So I think every time I'm on stage, I'm like, she's with me. She's right here with me because I feel that energy because I fear nothing I say. I fear no repercussion because I know what I say is true in my heart because she has taught me. So yeah, she was rare. The whole book is dedicated to her. So the beginning, you will see her, you will see my ancestors because I dedicate everything to them. Um, see you next time. It's in three weeks uh, that we have our next session. Ah, mm. uh, 4th November is the next Gång som vi har svenskhetens villkor. Så tack så mycket. Thank you for the Thank you everyone.